Peter Raymond is a professor at Yale University where he's in the School of Forestry and Environmental Science. Uh, prior to that, Pete was at uh, a postdoc at the Ecosystem Center in Woods Hole, and he got his PhD from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. However, uh, I think Pete got his start, if you will, uh, working with John Cole and myself as an undergraduate, and he did some uh, very interesting work on the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the Hudson River, and he and John ended up very, writing a very nice paper about that, and uh, I think that sort of launched Pete into his his interest in, in research and going to graduate school. Um, if you look at Pete's work, I think one of the things that really distinguishes his work is he sort of thinks about the carbon cycle, uh, particularly in, uh, along the reaction gradient from, say, the most headwater stream down to the, to the ocean. And he sort of encompasses sort of the, the, the ends of limnology and oceanography by looking at those two, pers the, those two end members, if you will. And uh, his papers uh, reflect this large and small aspect. He, he writes papers on things like the global uh, flux of CO2 from inland waters to the atmosphere, as he did in a recent nature piece, a synthesis, if you will, of a lot of data. Uh, and he, he also gets out there in the field and does uh, smaller scale observations and experiments and really gets his uh, hands dirty or hands wet, I guess you should say, uh, in the field. So he covers uh, this, this spectrum and does it very well. And in fact, I think we're going to see that today in his talk on, on looking at uh, streams and rivers as drainage reactor networks. So Pete, come on up. OK, thanks, Mike. Um, I'd actually like to start my talk by thanking Mike in three different ways. Um, the first is he, he mentioned he he gave me my start, uh, my first job, when I was 22. Um, and since then, I've continued to emulate and um, try to be as strong a scientist as Mike is. Uh, it's very important to have those role models when you're young, and I'd like to thank Mike for that. Um, the second is, since he knew me when, he's, when I was 22, he could have just told a bunch of embarrassing stories, and I'd like to thank him for, for not doing that. And then finally, um, the aquatic science meeting has always been one of my favorites. Um, and I think um, today, Mike, or this week, Mike and Isabel have met the high water mark uh, that this conference represents. So we're going to talk about drainage networks as reactors. And this is going to be a concept talk. It's going to be sort of defining uh, my research over the next few years instead of talking about a lot of my past research. And um, there's no better way to start a concept talk to, to begin with one of the great concept papers um, in network uh, or watershed ecology, and that is the river continuum concept. Um, for the oceanographers who might not be as familiar with this, this is a, this is a concept paper that it was a very large umbrella that many people could fit under. Um, and it talked a lot about organic matter, which today's talk is going to be on, and in particular, what it tried to do was it tried to marry scaling with uh, biogeochemistry. Um, and so the way it kind of worked was terrestrial organic matter comes in at these headwater streams. There's a set of organisms that are there to utilize it. They utilize large amounts of it, and they pass on organic matter that is um, gone through sort of a, a um, reactor. And then there's a second set of organisms that have adapted to use that organic matter and so on as you move through the continuum. Um, in this paper, they talked about DOM, and you can see it up in your upper left, the um, soluble organic matter. And the way it worked kind of was um, terrestrial organic matter went into these primary small headwater streams. Um, they were, they were um, sites of very large reactions. They would remove a lot of organic matter, create new compounds, so your diversity would peak in these small streams, and then the stuff would be removed gradually as you move down the continuum. And this idea of small streams as biogeochemical hotspots is still a central theme uh, in this area of research. And this fit very well into John's uh, active pipe model, which he published uh, a few years ago, right? This was sort of um, another concept that many of us could rally around in the inland water science community. And it pointed out the reactive nature 
of inland waters and drainage networks. Um, and so what I'm going to introduce is a new concept that I'm calling the, the pulse shunt concept and talk about it today with respect to terrestrial DOM and drainage networks. And it's a, it's a fairly simple concept. And the way it works is you take, um, you take organic matter that's pulsed into networks. And as, you, as I'll show you, uh, we now realize how important these pulsed, low-frequency events are for delivering organic matter into inland waters. Um, what also happens is when you have hydrologic events is the residence time of these reactors decreases. So there's very short residence time. And so what I'm going to argue is that a lot of this organic matter is actually shunted past the small streams and the reactions occur in larger rivers um, or even in the coastal ocean. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how watershed form allows you to do some scaling uh, um, of the pulse shunt. And so really, partly what I'm trying to argue is um, to bring back this concept of a passive pipe, um, to be a little controversial, and to try to look at um, under what instances are watersheds and drainage networks acting like an active pipe versus a passive pipe. Okay, so let, let, let's go over the pulse. This is something that is well established um, and is becoming even more established more recently. Some of the early papers were by Hornberger and Boyer. There's a paper by B Boyer um, from 1997 where she looked at this pulse in a snow melt dominated watershed. So you can see the hydrograph there is a solid line. The interesting thing about DOM is when the, um, these events occur, when discharge goes way, way up, the concentration responds by also going up, right? And because flux is a factor of concentration times discharge, this becomes very important for mass fluxes. Um, and they showed this early uh, in the snowmelt dominated systems. It was shown in numerous other places. Here's an, here's an example uh, from Ontario, some fall precipitation events. Again, you can see the hydrograph as a solid line. And when these pulses of water come out of the watershed, the concentration goes up. Um, this is something I did. Uh, with Jim Sears, it's a metadata analysis of s very small USGS watersheds. Um, we targeted watersheds with very little wetlands. Um, and what we found, um, you know, there were a lot of measurements, and we found the same thing occurs across these systems. And so as discharge goes up, the concentration responds by going up. And really, partly what we're interested in, in is how important are they from a mass transport point of view and one way to think about it, as it's in the text there, is that 60% of the export for DOM um, from these small watersheds occurs during just 15 days of the year. Um, so that sort of puts it in perspective. And now with the advent of po probes that allow us to sort of monitor this in real time, there are numerous studies that are demonstrating this across watersheds at much more high frequency. Um, this is an example from Harvard Forest by Henry Wilson. Um, and another thing that we're seeing is that the, the, the pulse, at least in temperate watersheds, does have this sort of seasonality. So you see, the, you see the increase in concentration in the winter, but it's muted compared to the summer and fall. So you get much larger uh, increases in concentrations in the summer and fall. In fact, I, I, I tried to somewhat create an index for this, um, how much the constant in concentration increases uh, with storm events in that metadata analysis. And so what you see here is a temperature sketch for, for these northeastern United States watersheds in black, and then this index of how the concentration responds in red. And you can see that it does start to increase as soon as these watersheds start to warm up, but the um, summer, and particularly late fall uh, with leaf drop, is particularly important in temperate watersheds. And so I'm going to now start to try to walk through a very simple um, mathematical model where we try to um, develop this concept, um, but also create some hypotheses from the model. And the first thing you want to do is you want to get an idea of, of, of the frequency of these events. And this has been something that's interested hydrologists for a long time. Um, they create graphs like this called um, flow exceedance graphs. And what you can see down on the, on the lower right is those are low discharge days. They happen a lot. They're exceeded most days of the year. 
And as you move up to the left, um, these are your very big hydrologic events, which happen very um, infrequently. Um, these patterns are very predictable. They follow sort of a semi-log normal distribution. And so you can um, determine these for, for different watersheds and different regions. And so I'm going to, I'm going to um, walk through an example, and this example is going to be for um, New England watersheds. And it's going to be from actual data that we sort of compiled. And so you can see in this black curve there, that's, that's the flow frequency curve for watersheds in the northeast of the United States. So your most frequent discharge, daily discharge, is a discharge of 0.1 centimeters per day. Um, an interesting thing that hydrologists have done is you can then plot that green curve, which is the concentration change with discharge over time. And that star is where those two points intersect. That's what they call the effective discharge. And that's when your watershed is doing the most work for moving DOM off the landscape. So it's sort of optimizing how frequent the events are versus how high that concentration gets. In New England, this effective discharge is around 0.8. So 0.8 centimeters per day is the average daily discharge that does the most work for moving DOM off the, off the small watersheds. Right, and so the, the way the pulse basically works is, is you try to look at flow frequencies and how different watersheds might m interact with that flow frequencies to create these types of um, plots uh, um, that, that I just went through. And then you take that material and you put it in your watershed. And you, I'm, I'm going to sort of now step through um, looking at watershed scales and scaling exercises um, that can be included in these very simple biogeochemical models. And these the watersheds are very cool because they're fractal, right? These are all three of these are drawings um, by da Vinci, uh, including a watershed, uh, the veins of a human arm, and the branches of a tree. And da Vinci recognized in, in the 1500s that um, they, they're very similar. And in fact, watersheds are fractal. And he had fractal language in some of his writing. Um, and so these branching patterns are predictable. And they lend themselves to scaling. Um, this was picked up by Horton, who is um, thought of as the, the father of hydrology. And he was very interested in using this scaling um, to look at erosion in watersheds. And shortly after that, um, it was built upon by Strahler. And Strahler introduced this idea of the stream orders, which is sometimes called the Strahler order or the Strahler-Horton stream order. And the way it works is you have your headwater streams are a stream order of one. And you'll see from that diagram when those two headwater streams meet, um, they make a stream order of two. And when the two second orders meet, they make a stream order of three and so on, up to the Amazon. And there's a bunch of what are called Horton ratios that drop out of this. And I've listed a few there. The first is the Horton law of, uh, or, or ratio of stream lengths. And what it means is that the ratio of s the lengths of second orders to first orders is the same as the ratio of the lengths of third orders to second orders and so on. So the self-similar fractal nature of watersheds creates these watersheds. There's another one called the uh, Horton law of, of watershed areas. You can see Strahler working on that on the upper left-hand diagram. And, and the Horton law of stream numbers. And these all fall out of the fractal nature of watersheds. And so when you, um, an, another great thing is now is you can, you can mine this data from, from um, data sets like NHD Plus um, and, and collect these for watersheds around the US and even around the world. And this is how it works for um, your average hypothetical or representative New England watershed. And, and within these, I, I, the scaling laws um, are obeyed. Um, and you can see the increase in stream length as you go up in stream order, right? the increase in area that follow these ratios, and the um, dominance of stream numbers in your, in your low orders. There's one more important one that isn't, doesn't get as much attention. And this is called the Tukunaga ratios. This is from a Japanese scientist. What this does is it allows you to connect up your watershed. Um, it has, it, it sh some of the ratios relate to the Horton ratios, 
Uh, but he has these two coefficients, these T1 and R2. And what this allows you to do is connect up your watershed. And so if you look at the, f the, the, the number eight, right, that's for a stream order eight. And where the eight meets the seven, that's the number of stream order sevens that are connected to a stream order eight in New England and so on. So you have 127 stream first order headwater streams that flow directly into a stream order eight and so on. So you can use these ra ratios to connect up your, your watershed and you can in fact study what causes these to vary across landscapes. And so the way this model works is you pulse this organic matter in with some of the hydrologic um, frequency graphs I, I showed earlier. You allow it to go in at stream orders all along the network, and then you try to follow it um, and allow it to be uh, removed by reactions as it flows down. And so to do this, you use very simple, we're right now just using very simple first order exponential decay, right, where the organic matter comes in and it's removed as a function of a decomposition constant in a residence time. Um, unfortunately, these are both very poorly resolved right now in the limnologic literature. They're both very, very tricky um, and difficult to um, pin down. Um, what, what we did for this is we scaled residence time um, as a function of the length and the velocity. Um, and you could calculate velocity um, based on hydraulic um, equations like the one on the far left. And what you see is that as you go up in stream order, right, velocity goes up. Um, this is played out in measurements. However, the length goes up faster. So your residence time becomes longer as, you, as your stream order goes up. So the most residence time is in your larger systems. And these are residence times that we estimate for that discharge of 0.8, that effective discharge, or the discharge that's most important for moving terrestrial DOM off the landscape. And so the basis for the shunt is that you're bypassing those short, those small stream orders because the residence time is so low. Um, this, this is not a new finding. Um, this has recently been argued in a number of nutrient spiraling papers in the literature that, are, that come to similar conclusions, sort of try to reestablish in this idea that, that large rivers might be important for reaction sites due to this residence time change. Um, and so, although, although we might not believe the absolute residence times we're assigning by our, ex, by our exercise, um, we're very confident that residence time scales with discharge. I don't think that's a very difficult um, concept to, um, to get your, to, to, to agree with. And so what we're saying is that that low discharge when the residence time is low, this is when you're an active pipe. And at high discharge when, when residence time is very quick, uh, um, this is when you're a passive pipe. Um, and the question is, how does this work out over the course of a year? Um, decomposition constant, there's only a handful of studies. There's been actually, there are new methods and people are approaching this from different ways and there's been a couple of good talks on it this week. Um, we chose a, a decomposition constant from the literature and modeled as a function of temperature, just assigning it a simple few ten. Um, and so basically what you're doing is you're taking these flow frequencies and these mass flux frequencies pushing the stuff into the watershed and you're asking, given the change in residence time or change in decomposition constant, where is the sweet spot for the, for the removal? In which stream order is most of this removal occurring? Uh, I've struggled with how to present this. Um, I've come up with this network diagram here. So this is sort of the end result for this representative um, New England watershed. And the number is a stream order, and the size of the circle is the amount of terrestrial DOM that's removed in that stream order. And so um, we conclude that, in fact, these large rivers are the active sites for removal. And then what we also find is that the, the, the size of the lines connecting the stream orders is the amount of that DOM, say, in the eighth order that was removed and delivered from a seventh order, sixth order, and fifth order. And what you find is that it's really only the preceding three stream orders 
that's important for delivering um, DOM, reactive DOM, to these large rivers. This idea that um, small streams are important for feeding um, reactive DOM to large rivers is not supported uh, by this exercise. And then you can do a couple other things to just sort of maybe generate hypotheses. Um, one thing you can do is you can hold the decomposition constant, constant, and then you can um, vary the size of the events that occur in a given year, but keeping the total discharge constant. So this is three examples where the total discharge out the watershed is 60 centimeters per year, but it comes from a range of 60 very small events to 10 very large events. And there's a couple things that happen. The first is because concentration goes up with event size, the flux off the landscape is greatest um, when you have very few large events. However, what also happens is because the shunt is occurring uh, more when you have these very large events, the percentage that's removed in the watershed also goes down. So there's sort of a double additive effect for export to the coast where these, these large events, because you have a lot moving off the landscape and a smaller percentage removed, they dominate the export um, to the coast. So these, these hydrologic events are very important for exporting DOM to the coast. Um, the other thing you could do is you can sort of keep discharge constant and allow that Q10 or the decomposition constant to change to look in at seasonality. And that's what we've done here. And um, what you find is that because concentrations are higher with higher temperatures, you get a greater removal of material off the landscape in summer events. Um, however, you get, you get a get greater transport off the landscape with these summer events. However, you get, also get very large removal rates. So I think these summer and fall events are particularly important for supporting the allochthony of inland waters, and particularly these large rivers. And um, also, if you, if you sort of look in at the, at the export to the ocean, there's some sort of trade-off between increasing, increasing the, the concentration, allowing more to come off the landscape, but sort of um, fighting that larger removal rate in the watershed. So there's some intermediate temperature that's optimal for moving stuff um, to the coast. I think this is a really cool figure. This one is, is by Guth et al. in 2011. What he tried to do here was um, um, show the size of the watershed um, at, its terminal, at its terminal point. So what this is is um, the this, this stream order of watersheds around the globe when they terminate either into the coast or into a closed inland water basin. And there are very lot, there are um, some very important, very large rivers, right? And the large rivers are gonna act more like passive pipes than smaller systems. There are, however, periods, portions of the globe, particularly areas like the Mid-Atlantic Bight, um, where there are no large watersheds. And I, um, I postulate that the small and medium-sized watersheds are going to be more like passive pipes and export a greater percentage of their terrestrial DOM um, to the coastal ocean and inland waters. And so I guess, I guess what we're trying to do here is modify this, this plumbing diagram that, that John came up with and um, start, to, start to develop ideas or, or develop a model that allows rivers to be both passive um, and active pipes. And we're arguing that one of the main things that's switching inland waters between a passive and active pipe is, is the discharge rate. Um, so that high discharge uh, pushes a system to a passive pipe and low discharge um, an active pi pipe. <coughs> and, and you could take that further and start to list, and these are just some of the ones I went over in the talk, right? Um, you're gonna have active pipe more active pipes when waters are warmer, when watersheds are larger, and when um, flow is lower, um, and the vice versa for, for passive pipes. And I think the, the, the perfect example or representation of this passive pipe is, is Arctic rivers, um, because these are rivers where 
you have the maximum discharge during the cold water and cold, cold water temperatures. And so what Max showed here is again you see this, you see the discharge sketch in black and the blue points are concentration, so just, just the concentrations are going up with discharge, but the numbers next to them are the percent of that material that's bioreactive. And so in these systems you have the highest amount of bioreactive getting out of the watershed during these cold high flow periods. So I think this is a very nice demonstration um, of the pulse shunt. And then just to sort of wrap this up, I, I've, I've sort of presented a very um, um, straight talk, right, where you have precipitation events, they sort of lead to these changes in, in these, in these um, the hydrograph and the mass flux discharge, and then they come into a watershed uh, and are routed out. Um, there's also many reasons to believe that um, watershed form, right, um, that is, this, this is a quote, this came slightly out of water from Frank, Roy, from Frank Lloyd Wright, that um, there, is, there is a sort of chance for watershed form and this function of DOM export to, to act together or against each other. And one very new way is there's, there's some recent research that's showing some of these hydraulic scaling laws also vary as a function of climate. And so there could be additive or complementary or negative effects between climate that create this, the, the pulse, but also create this sort of how your, how your watershed looks and how your watershed is connected, um, which is an interesting area of future research. Um, so to just conclude, uh, event statistics I think are critical. They're just as important as the total flux when looking at export. Um, they cause systems to become passive pipes. Um, there's a lot of research that needs to be done on watershed form and residence time and scaling residence time and the decomposition constant. Uh, we were funded to do a little bit of this through one of these NSF macro systems. And my colleagues are uh, Jim Sears and Bill Sobzak. Um, we have a paper submitted on this. And we're also working with Aaron Stubbins and Jamie Shanlin and John Morrison from the from USGS and Ashley Helping from UConn. So uh, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and have a good Friday. <laughs>